back in the introductory lesson of this course and as a motivation for you to join me along on this course, I asked you to take a moment to see if you can explain the two TLS cipher suites presented on this slide. I'm still equally convinced as I was back in the introduction that by the end of this course, all of you will be able to explain TLS cipher suites, so just these two ones. In the last lesson, I outlined the five cryptographic processes taking place within TLS and explained how it's the cipher suites that specify how these five cryptographic processes are really implemented within a TLS connection. With this, we are now in a good position to make full sense of cipher suites such as these two ones. Going from left to right across the TLS 1.2 cipher suite, reading TLS ECDIG RSA with AES 256, CBC SHA 256, we can see that the first part following the generic prefix TLS reads ECDIG. ECDIG is the ephemeral elliptic curve Diffie Hellman key exchange we discussed in the Essentials of Cryptography chapter, and such a key exchange serves the purpose of the client and the server agreeing on a master secret. The next part in the cipher suite to the right of ECDHE reads RSA, and this part of the cipher suite specifies that the peers involved in a TLS connection making use of this cipher suite are authenticated by using RSA-based digital signatures. If we go to the next non-generic part in the cipher suite to the right of RSA, we get to a part that reads AES 256 CBC. This part specifies that confidentiality is provided to the application data exchanged after the handshake protocol by symmetrically encrypting the application data with the AES block cipher behind the CPC block cipher mode of operation and using 256-bit symmetric AES keys. The last part of this cipher suite, its tail, so to speak, reads SHA-256, which stands for the SHA-2 cryptographic hash function with 256-bit hash values. Within TLS 1.2, this cryptographic hash function is then used in two places. The first place this cryptographic hash function is used is as part of the HMAC message authentication code that's used to provide authenticity to the application data exchanged later between the client and the server. The second place this cryptographic hash function is used within TLS 1.2 is as part of the PRF pseudorandom function, which is used by TLS to derive encryption keys and keys for HMAC from the initial master secret agreed on by the client and the server. This is it. We just successfully deciphered a TLS 1.2 cipher suite. Knowing about the five cryptographic processes taking place within TLS and having a basic idea of the essentials of cryptography, deciphering such a TLS cipher suite is suddenly not that difficult anymore. To fully explain a TLS 1.3 cipher suite, we need to know that within TLS 1.3, the authentication of the peers still takes place via asymmetric public-private key pairs. Where TLS 1.2 cipher suites clearly specified the type of the public-private key pair, TLS 1.3, however, derives this type either from the corresponding X509 certificate received from the peers, or derives this type from information attached to the raw public key. Also within TLS 1.3, the peers always agree on a master secret by either using the ephemeral Devi Hellman key exchange DHE or ECDHE or a pre-shared key. With this very limited choice, there is no need to have it explicitly specified within a cipher suite and a client will just optimistically send a selection of supported key exchange methods together with corresponding ECDHE half keys to the server. If the server supports one of the key exchange methods sent by the client, the handshake proceeds. Otherwise, the client restarts the connection with a different set of key exchange methods. Last that we need to know to explain TLS 1.3 cipher suites is that within TLS 1.3, 
only authenticated encryption with associated data ciphers are used. With this understanding of TLS 1.3, let's now look at the first part of this TLS 1.3 cipher suite reading AES 256 GCM. This part specifies the authenticated encryption with associated data cipher, which in this case is the AES block cipher behind the GCM block cipher mode of operation using 256-bit AES keys. GCM, as an instance of authenticated encryption with associated data, now provides both confidentiality and authenticity to the application data, and as such, we are only left to have the key derivation specified by the cipher suite. The key derivation is then specified by the last part of this cipher suite, and in this case reads SHA-384, indicating the SHA-2 cryptographic hash function with 384-bit hash values. This hash function is then used for the derivation of the keys for the AEAD cipher AES-256-GCM, this derivation starts with the agreed on master secret and takes place via the HMAC based key derivation function HKDF, which is a construction that is built on top of HMAC and as such requires to be provided with a hash function. That's it. Knowing about the five cryptographic processes that need to take place within TLS, we just successfully also deciphered a TLS 1.3 cipher suite. Myself, each time that I see these slides feel fascinated how the various existing cryptographic primitives, if mixed together properly, lay the foundation for a powerful protocol such as TLS that then allows to construct a secure channel between a client and a server that have never met before.